And please open your Bible, if you have one, to Deuteronomy 18. You'll find the notes to this morning's message in the bulletin or online. And uh, this morning we will complete our four-week look at the Messiah in the Old Testament. Come thou long-expected Jesus. In the beginning next week, God willing, we'll begin our year-long study of Psalm 119. The plan is to dive into Psalm 119 and take it slowly, each strophe by each strophe. And then, after a few weeks of that, to dive into the book of James, and then maybe return once a month and push a little farther, farther forward in Psalm 119. But this morning, we're going to consider our last look at the Messiah in the Old Testament, at least in the last for now. And this series could easily have been 20 parts, 30 parts. Um, there's a sense in which the, the threads I'm pulling on are arbitrary, because why not pursue Jesus' priesthood? But we've seen in the, in the weeks prior... That Jesus is, this baby in the manger, is the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, the promised seed. As that promise was first made in Genesis chapter 3, and then as a promise of seed was given to Abraham. So one way to understand him and the expectation is God has kept his promise in the garden. God has kept his promise to Abraham. And then in our second week... We considered the promises God made to King David about a greater son, about an eternal dynasty, about never lacking a man for his throne. And we considered this child born, um, as titled by the Magi, born king of the Jews. This is the Messianic king, the Davidic heir. Christmas Eve, we considered Jesus as the second or last Adam. That, that what the first Adam failed to do in the garden, the second Adam has triumphed in. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. This morning I want to consider another um, theme, and that is the prophet like Moses. The prophet like Moses. This was a, and still remains, a expectation of the Jews. In John chapter 1, after you get out of the prologue, the, uh, the Jews in Jerusalem, the Pharisees, send people to question John the Baptist. Listen to the questions they ask him. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to them, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You may have picked up that notion, the prophet. Well, that comes from a promise of God made in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Um, There are three offices in the Old Testament anointed, and if you remember the word Messiah is simply transliterating the Hebrew Messiah, which into Greek becomes Christos, which in English is anointed. So remember again, Messiah, Christ, and anointed are Hebrew, Greek, and English for the same thing. And they anointed the king, they anointed the priests, and at least in a few instances, notably 1 Kings 19, Prophets could be anointed. And so you could refer to these as the Lord's anointed. And in Deuteronomy 18, we get this prediction for a unique prophet. There's a ministry of the prophets you can read about in the Old Testament. And yet within that ministry of prophets, one promised prophet stands taller than the other. So I'd like to read to you this section of Deuteronomy 18. We're going to look at the promise of a coming prophet. And then we'll look at the fulfillment in Christ. Now, before we look at the actual passage here, I want you to notice the context in Deuteronomy. Starting in chapter 17, in verses 14 to 20, we have rules about the king, the office of the king. We don't know when they're going to get a king, but the Lord says, hey, when you, you will eventually have a king, here are his rules. So rules for the king in 17, 14 to 20. In 18, 1 to 8, we have the priesthood and its rules. So we have first the king, then the priest. Then in 18, 9 through 14, we have a list of abominable practices, 
sorcery, forbidden. Here's where you're not to find your information. Here's where you're not to turn. And then we get the promise of a prophet like Moses. So it is interesting in Deuteronomy, grouped together here, we have kingship, priesthood, and then the prophet. And so Moses writes this in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They have spoken what is right. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words into his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, the same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know what the word of the Lord has spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord... If the word does not come to pass or come true, then it is a word that the Lord has not spoken, and the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. I have a word of prayer, and we'll dive in. Lord God, um, we take great comfort in knowing that you are a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. We do not deserve warrant the many lavish promises you have made to us, promises of grace, promises of help, promises of forgiveness, and yet you make them to us. And we have absolute certainty that you will keep the promises you have made and in part looking to your record of of keeping promises, we find encouragement. Lord, thank you for promising to send a prophet like Moses and thank you for in fact doing so in Christ Jesus. Help us now as we study this passage to see the scope and the magnitude of your promise and the greatness of its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Amen. So, what I propose to do is this. In two points, um, looking at this passage and then briefly another passage in Deuteronomy, I want to outline what is contained within the promise, what exactly is being promised, and then look and see how the New Testament shows this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, you, some of you may remember that when we concluded our study of Luke, one of the summary messages I did to tie up our four-and-a-half-year study was Luke's presentation of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And so we've seen the, the tracing of Jesus presented as the prophet like Moses in Luke. So this morning, I'm actually going to try to show that in John's gospel. These are themes shown thoroughly in the New Testament. And just by looking at John, you can see just how clearly This point is made. It is no small point. So in John's gospel, primarily, we'll be looking at the presentation of this fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So first, what can we learn about this coming prophet from Deuteronomy 18? Well, first, he will be sent of God, meaning he is not self-appointed. He is not self-appointed. Like all the great points in redemptive history, God takes the initiative. Just as when David said, hey, I'll build a house for you, the Lord said, no, 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 I'll build a house for you. Here, God is going to send this prophet. Whoever this prophet is, he's sent of God. God stands behind him. This is not something the prophet came up with, trained for. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. Verse 18, again, I will raise up for them a prophet. So the first point, whoever this prophet is, It will not be their idea, their initiative. The Lord God will raise him up and send him, okay? Second, he will be like Moses. You put there a prophet. We've got to pause and understand that Moses is speaking to the people of Israel as they're getting ready to take possession of the land. And in that sense, Moses really is the only prophet thus far God's people have received. He, He was the one God raised up in Egypt. Through him, the exodus occurred. And so we know more prophets come later, but but Moses is really the first one who spoke to God's people for God. And so I've got to pause and explain to you the very nature of a prophet. 
This text highlights it. Um, he, he stands between the people and God. Moses goes up on the mountain, and he stands for the people, and he speaks to the people for God. The people are terrified of God speaking to them lest they die. And so the way you can think of this, the two roles, prophet and priest, both stand between the people and God. If you want to picture God behind me, the people this way. The, the, the priest ministers on behalf of the people to God. The prophet speaks to the people for God. And so Moses is this first one who comes down from the mountain with a word from God. And God says, I'll raise up another prophet like Moses. Now we're going to see some other similarities, some other points. That like Moses is kind of a big deal. And we'll look at that particularly in Deuteronomy 34. Next, it says, he'll be from among your brothers, which means he'll be an Israelite or not a Gentile. This is one of the main reasons why Islam has never really gained any traction in the Jewish community. Because, of course, um, the the Muslim prophet is a Gentile. Muhammad, right? That's their great prophet. Well, this text says the great prophet the Lord is going to raise up will be from your brothers. So it's a non-starter to suggest the great prophet is not an Israelite. We've got a prophet who will not be self-appointed, sent by God, fulfilling the prophet office as um, started by Moses. He will not be a Gentile, and he will speak to the people for God. Your blank there is a mediator, and that's what I was trying to get at before. At Sinai, in a sense, the people initially are offered an unmediated relationship to God, or if not, they don't want that. They make it clear, we don't want to hear his voice, we'll die, we don't want to see the fire, you go talk to him for us, you tell him what, you tell us what he has to say. And so the prophet stands as a mediator, a go-between. That's one of the primary functions of a prophet. And, And the last point from this is this, this prophet that God will raise up must be obeyed must be obeyed. To defy him is to defy God. Now, that again gets repeated, right? It is to him you shall listen. And the idea of listening is listening and internalizing and obeying. It's not just, I heard him, but when the Proverbs again and again, my son, listen to me, my son, listen to me. It's listening, paying attention, and then doing, clearly in view. So God says, I'm going to raise up a prophet from among your brothers. I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to put my words in his mouth. He's going to speak to you on my behalf. He's going to stand in between me and you. And you better listen to him. And then he makes it clear. Look at verse 18. I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I'll put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. So God says, it's not... This prophet's words you're ignoring. You're ignoring, ignoring my words when you ignore him. So, this is the primary passage. And what do we learn? It's not self-appointed. He'll be a prophet. He won't be a Gentile. He will stand between. He'll mediate between God's people, speaking God's word to them. And he must be obeyed. Now, this theme gets picked up a little later in Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy 34. One of the reasons we can tell this is a serious passage, a big deal, is it gets picked up again. At the close of Deuteronomy, we read the following. I'll pick it up in verse 7. These are the last verses of Deuteronomy. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed, his vigor unabated. The people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended, and Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And whether Moses wrote this prophetically about his death or whether Joshua amended Deuteronomy and added this final portion in, You get the idea that whoever's writing expects, we might think, oh, so Joshua is the prophet like Moses. He's the successor. 
I mean, after all, doesn't Joshua do a similar miracle at Jordan when the Jordan parts, like the Red Sea? And we read, as, as, as much as Joshua was given wisdom, as much as the people obeyed him, as much as the God did works through Joshua that could be compared to Moses, verse 10 makes it very clear we're not to make that conclusion. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So, we learned the baton, the prophetic baton of leadership is passed to Joshua. And Joshua's great. He's got wisdom. The people are listening to him. But he is not a prophet like Moses. We're looking for someone greater. We're looking for someone who excels further. And again, by, by reiterating this promise, it leaves us at the end of the Pentateuch with a sense of expectation. Well, if not Joshua, then who? We have to wait and see. So, four more things I'd suggest we learn from this about this prophet. First, notice the, the emphasis on Moses' close and intimate fellowship with God. Moses had close and intimate fellowship with God. There's not arisen a prophet like um, arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And if you remember, that became kind of a, a, a deal of. Uh, not conflict, but a, a notable deal. Moses would go and meet with God and his face would shine. He had to wear a veil over it because it creeped the people out. And it was indicating Moses got access to God unlike any other priest, any other leader in Israel. When Moses' brother Aaron and Miriam stand up and they want to be sort of equals with him and God rebukes them, God emphasizes this also in Numbers 12, 6 through 9, as God responds to them. Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So there were many people... If not many, there were more than one. There's a plurality of people who had a prophetic office in Israel, even contemporaries with Moses. But Moses stood unique, and one of the things that made him stand unique was his intimate, close access to God. And so, this passage highlights that we would expect the coming prophet like Moses would have equally or superior access and intimacy with God. That's one of the things that makes Moses unique that's the lines upon which God rebukes Aaron and Miriam for their presumption. Yes, in some sense they had a prophetic function, but not like Moses, not face to face. Second, Moses worked mighty public miracles. You see that highlighted in this passage as well. You may get the impression the Bible is just filled with miracles. It really isn't. The periods of miracles form around three clusters there's a cluster of miracles around Moses and his ministry. There's a cluster of miracles around Elijah and Elisha. And there's a cluster of miracles around Jesus and the, the apostles in the book of Acts. There are other miracles as well, but where they appear in, in droves, where they appear in, in, in manyness, that's not even a word, where, <laughs> where they appear in plurality, of those three main points. And yet Moses, compared to, say, Elijah and Elisha, other prophets, his miracles are done publicly. So Elijah raises the widow's son, but the widow knows about it. But, but Moses is doing big miracles in front of large crowds. And that's highlighted in this text. None like him from all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all the land. You think about the ten plagues. And God is using Moses to administer them. They're, being, they're functioning through him. Moses striking the rock and water coming out. Um, Jesus will refer to the, the correct the people. They'll say Moses gave them the manna in the wilderness. And Jesus says, no, it wasn't Moses. But you can see how they thought that Moses was functioning when the manna distribution happened. So Moses 
was functioning as a prophet. And in his ministry and through his ministry, the Lord did many notable, public, huge miracles. And so we'd expect the prophet like Moses to do similar works. Okay? Third, now this passage doesn't highlight it, but it's such an obvious point about Moses, I think it needs to be made. And I, and I think it's fair. Moses gave the people the law. Moses gave the people the law. Now, the Lord did it through Moses, but Moses brought the law to the people. In Exodus 24, 12, the Lord calls him up onto the mountain specifically to give the law to the people. Jesus will make a point of this. John's gospel, we'll see a little bit later, makes that crystal clear. The law came through Moses. So Moses was the prophet who brought the people the covenant, the law covenant by which they relate with the Lord. Perhaps the prophet, like Moses, whose coming future will also bring a law and a covenant. We'll see. We'll see. Moses gave the people the law. Moses also is the, the first prophet to write down the, the movement from an oral word to a written word. In Deuteronomy 31.9, we read... Um, then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priest, the son of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and all the elders of Israel. So Moses is raised up as a prophet, and in Moses, the movement from an oral word of God to a written word of God takes place as well, so that Joshua 1.8 can have this book of the law. What book of the law? The book Moses just finished writing. So by the very next leader, we've got written revelation in Scripture. Moses gave the people the law. And fourth, Moses delivered God's people from slavery. It's, it's hinted at here with a reference to Pharaoh and his court and the miracles. But that's the other big notable point of, of Moses. We look to the great saving event of God as the cross, and rightly so. But before Jesus came, what did the Israelites look to again and again as their picture of salvation, as the great saving work of God in the Old Testament? It's the deliverance from Egypt. Where God freed his people from slavery. He entered into a covenant with them and he gave them a land. And so Moses mediated that as well. And Moses, in many respects, is without peer in the Old Testament. He brought the law covenant to the people. Through him, the Lord delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. Moses had unparalleled intimate fellowship with God Moses worked unparalleled miracles. And so the promise we're to see is we're to expect, what we're looking for is someone, I'll, re, I'll go through the list again, not self-appointed, God sending them. They'll be a prophet like Moses. They'll be from Israel. They won't be a Gentile. They will stand between God and his people speaking the very words of God. God gives them the words. And then because of that, the people have an obligation to listen like Moses, this prophet will have intimate fellowship with God. Like Moses, this person will work many mighty public miracles. And as Moses brought a covenant to the people, giving them the law, we might expect something similar to happen. And Moses, as he delivered God's people from slavery, perhaps this new prophet, this greater prophet, will do the same. I, th I think you know the answer to that. But let's... Uh, Let's now consider the fulfillment of God's promise in Christ. So that's the expectation. And you may well understand now why, given all that's hanging on this, the prophet, the Jews who come and interrogate John the Baptist, one, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet? Because the prophet's going to be a big deal. This is no small person, no small ministry. Big shoes he needs to fill. And we'll see Jesus amply does so. So let's look at the first First requirement, was Jesus sent by the God or did Jesus come on his own initiative? Turn to John chapter 5. And we'll just be moving around in John now for the rest of our time, answering these questions. My goal is that by the end of our time this morning, you will see and be fully convinced Jesus is this prophet. God has kept his word. Now in John's gospel, we see a pattern emerge where Jesus works a miracle, and that sets up a discourse, sets up a discussion. And so in John chapter 5, he heals the man at the pool, which sets up a discourse. John is interested, interestingly, oftentimes not in what Jesus taught, but the authority for which he taught. This is one of those examples. He works a miracle, and the Jews come to him, 
and, and they're, they're frustrated. They're, they, they, they have an objection because the result of this miracle is this man's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. So didn't Jesus lead this man to break the Sabbath? And Jesus takes him head on. In verse 17, he answered, my father is working until now and I'm working. Which is to say, God works on the Sabbath, so so do I. It is a huge claim. It's not a way to calm a fight. That's a way to escalate one. Um, he could have argued, and he does later. This is remarkable. In John 7, he'll say to the crowd, look, do you really think I was working on the Sabbath? The priest does circumcision on the, on the uh, eighth day. And if the eighth day is a Sabbath, he does that. So if the priest can do that without breaking the Sabbath, do you really think I'm breaking the Sabbath? He could have argued along those lines. And if he had here, they wouldn't be trying to kill him. He could have said, like, guys, you really think this guy's earning a little extra money as a mat carrier? Come on. But instead, his answer is, I claim divine prerogative. If God does it, so do I. If God can work on the Sabbath, then I can. No problem. And they understand what he's saying, and they want to kill him. And then Jesus goes into a discourse where he simultaneously is trying to guard against the notion that he's raising himself up as a competing God, and yet also guarding against the notion that he's a little G God. And so he's going to argue both for his equality with the Father and his full conformity to the will of his Father. Look at verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man could do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show you so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Jump ahead to verse 30. I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, for he has borne witness to the truth. And he goes on. We'll look more at this passage in a few minutes, but just pick up the point. Jesus makes it clear. This is not my idea. I can do nothing on my own authority. My Father has sent me. I've come to do the will of another. Jesus could not be more clear on this point. So does Jesus meet the qualification of one sent by God? Absolutely. And again and again in John's gospel, Jesus speaks of the one who sent me, the one who sent me. So Jesus is sent by God. At least that is his testimony. Second, he was a great prophet. Now turn to chapter 4. And you'll see how big of a theme this is in John's gospel. We saw in chapter 1, they're looking for the prophet. So Jesus interacts with the woman at the well. And look at 419. After Jesus reveals to her that he knows about her three past husbands, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Okay? Not necessarily the prophet, but here's the first time where a prophet is being attributed to Jesus. Turn to chapter 6. Verse 14, here we get from the people, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Now there, unambiguously, the title, the one they were seeking in chapter 1, is being ascribed to Jesus. They see the sign of the feeding of the 5,000, and they say, this indeed is the prophet. Go to chapter 7. Verse 40. This is in response to Jesus standing up on the last day of the feast, crying out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow waters, rivers of living waters. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When the people heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. You see how John is again and again emphasizing this. He sets up the expectation in chapter 1, and then we reading, following along, see again and again the people attributing this to him. In chapter 9, a little further over. Pick it up in verse 16, chapter 9. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there's a vision among them. So they again said to the blind man, what do you say about him? And since he has opened your eyes, he said, he is a prophet. 
And if you were to continue on, I won't ask you to turn them, but I'll read to you. Lest there be any doubt, the New Testament authors, the apostles, clearly affirm that Jesus is the greater prophet. Listen to um, Peter in Acts 3, in his great sermon at Pentecost. Moses said, and he quotes it, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whoever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. Or Stephen, as he's preaching his message before they stone him to death, um, says in Acts 7.37, This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. So it's not simply that we have to be deductive in, in solving this problem. We're told clearly the answer. Who is the prophet like Moses? Jesus. I'm just trying to show you that Jesus fully conforms to and fulfills the promise in every respect. He is a great prophet. Point C, yes, Jesus was an Israelite. This is one of the reasons why the genealogies are in two of the Gospels. Many of God's promises link specifically to descent, the seed of the woman. David, from your own body will come forth a king. And here, this prophet has to be an Israelite. And so we learn clearly that is who Jesus is, born under the law. And in John's gospel, they make it clear in chapter 1, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom the law, Moses in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Jesus fulfills that requirement. Next, did Jesus speak the word of God? Yes, he did. In fact, he was the word of God. He spoke the word of God and revealed him to the people. Turn back to John chapter 1. There's a remarkable verse here. And this is one of those places where I think sometimes the Greek can actually bring some extra nuance out. And in a passage, I'll I'll start in verse 16. We'll get to verse 18. Because I want you to see Moses is being contrasted with Jesus here. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now, even though Moses is contrasted with the other prophets as one who sees God face to face, in the great moment up on the mountain when Moses is interceding for the people after the golden calf, and he says, show me your glory, what does God say? You you can't see my glory. You'll die. And he hides in the cleft of the rock. So even as in one sense Moses is the prophet who speaks to God face to face, he has not fully seen God face to face. When God's glory passes by, Moses is hid from it. So the contrast is made here. This prophet is seeing God's glory. But I want you to look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The Greek there is literally to exposit. We talk about exegetical or expository preaching. You could translate this, he has translated him. And the picture is this. No one has ever seen God. The only God is at the Father's side. He has fully revealed him. He has fully translated him. He has fully brought forth and communicated who he is. And of course, that becomes a huge theme in John's gospel. Turn to chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. Because Jesus translates, Jesus reveals the Father. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I will not judge him. For I do not come into the world to judge, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. 
The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has given, has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, what I say therefore, I say as the Father has told me. I'll raise up a prophet from among you. I'll put my words in his mouth. Jesus is making that exact claim. He's making that exact claim. We'll turn over to chapter 14 in the upper room. Picking it up in verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. It is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So the prophet was going to reveal God's word, speak God's word to his people, just as the people at Sinai said, we can't hear his voice. You go speak to him and come back and tell us what he said. Does Jesus mediate between God and his people? Yes, he does. And the amazing thing is, this one who mediates is himself God. The mediator is God and man. This is the dilemma Job spoke about in Job chapter 9. He is not a man as I am that I might answer him. We should come to trial together. There is no arbiter who might lay his hand on us both. Well, Jesus can lay his hand on us both. Jesus can, as man, we can come to him, and he is God. In coming to him, we come to God. This is the basis on which Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So John makes that point emphatically. Well then, if Jesus is indeed the prophet, sent by the Father, and if God has given him his word to speak, and in fact, Jesus is given the title, the word of God, Driving this point home, you know the opening of the book of Hebrews. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Then, to defy, to ignore him, is to defy or ignore God the Father. If this is true, and here's where we're getting to some of the so what, what was the obligation, the ethical requirement attached. I'm going to raise up a prophet, God says, you need to listen to him. You need to listen to him. To defy him is to defy God the Father. And Jesus makes this point in chapter 12, turn back a page. And we saw the beginning of this passage in verse 44. Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees him who sent me. I've come into the world as light so that Whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to the world, to but to save the world, to judge, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The words that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Or turn back to John 3. Does it matter whether we hear and obey Jesus? Listen to this amazing statement. Last verse of John 3. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. God has kept his word, so you better listen. I better listen. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You ignore Jesus, you ignore the one who sent him. There is no room for, I believe in God, I just don't follow Jesus. Jesus makes it clear how you deal with him is how you deal with God. Next, 
He has intimate fellowship with the Father. And John's gospel, again, makes that point abundantly clear. In John 17, Jesus cries out, longing for the glory he had with God at the beginning. Even John 1.1 1, 1, uh, makes it clear. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Literally, the Word was towards God. That is face to face, God's fellow, God's equal. But how's about John 5? It's just an absolutely breathtaking statement Jesus makes. So Jesus said to them, verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son. How does the Father show his love to the Son in this passage? And shows him all that he himself is doing. Jesus is saying, and the argument here he's building is, I don't do anything on my own authority. I only do what God, I see God do. But God loves me, and therefore he shows me all that he does. And so what Jesus is saying is, I have full, unfettered, unhindered, complete access and knowledge to God the Father. And then everything that I see him do, I do in response. This is the basis for why Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father's love for the Son here is shown in his full self-revelation to the Son. We get to know who God is. The scripture does not give us a full, exhaustive revelation of who God is. It wouldn't be possible. So we get to see much of his glory. But as Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, there are plenty of secret things not revealed to us. Not so with the Son. The Father loves the Son and shows him that all he is doing, and then the Son responds by imitating and doing all that he sees. So does, does this prophet have close, intimate fellowship with God the Father, you, you bet he does. He has amazing Trinitarian fellowship with God. Okay, Moses worked many miracles. Jesus worked many mighty miracles. And they also were public. You can just think of the feeding of 5,000, the raising of Lazarus in John 11. John 20, verses 30 and 31, sums up the whole book this way. Get there, 20, 30, and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So even if you would add up all the signs and miracles Jesus did in John's gospel, John is saying, and he did a ton more. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So yeah, Jesus worked greater and mightier miracles than Moses. And John's gospel makes that comparison clear. Another place is in chapter 6, after Jesus um, feeds them. They come across to the other side of the lake, and they say to them, um, so they said to him, well, what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? Verse 30. These are the same people that were there the day before when he fed them. What sign will you do? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses. Um, sorry. Verse 31. Sorry, I skipped 31. They then make a suggestion to Jesus. What sign will you do? Um, our fathers ate man in the wilderness. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Hint, hint, Jesus, that food thing you did yesterday, that, that'd be good. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. You see how the comparisons being made there? Another point in John's gospel, Jesus' ministry, Moses' ministry being compared. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So Jesus worked many mighty and greater miracles than Moses. And of course, the supreme miracle is the resurrection. Supreme miracle is the resurrection. Turn back to chapter 1. As we try to round the corner and get to our closing song. Moses brought the people a covenant from Sinai. And opening his gospel, John makes this comparison. We saw this in verse 16. And this is another place where I, I, I don't think the translators got this right. This is one of those distinctions I think actually is important. He says in verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received, and then your ES, my ESV says, grace upon grace. But look at the footnote. Um, the Greek preposition is anti. Or, Grace in place of grace. A grace replacing a grace. 
I think that's the idea. I think verse 17 makes it clear that's the idea. For the law was given through Moses. There's a grace in the giving of the law. We'll see in Psalm 119, David is ecstatic, praising, excited about your law. Seven times a night I get up to praise you for your law. There is goodness and grace in God giving the law. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus brings the new covenant, right? And that is greater still. So here's another comparison, explicit in John's gospel. Moses brought the law. Grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. From his fullness, we have all received a grace in place of a grace. A greater grace, a greater covenant comes through Jesus Christ. And finally, Moses delivered his people from slavery. Jesus has delivered his people from bondage to sin and death. Just look over to the next page, John 1.29 John the Baptist points to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In chapter 3, 14 to 15, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Or in John 8, turn over to John 8. Starting in 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now they pick up on this. This is a slavery language. Because they answered him, We're offspring of Abraham, and have never been slaves of anyone, except the Egyptians, and at times the Philistines, and the Babylonians, and the Medo-Persians. But apart from them, we've never been slaves of anybody. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. This is the slavery that matters. And if you practice sin, you're a slave to sin. And Jesus has come that you might be set free. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me. So let me bring this um, to a close with a simple point. We've tried to look at what we'd expect from this prophet. We've tried to see, just in John's gospel, how fully, completely Jesus fulfills this role. So let's go back to the very beginning. God makes a promise. It's free grace. I'm going to raise up a prophet. But there is an ethical obligation and response on our part in response to that. And it's really simple. Listen to him. Right? The Lord your God will raise up from among you a prophet like me. It is to him you shall listen. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. Verse 18. I'll put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command. Whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. So God has kept his word. He's fulfilled his promise. He has sent a greater prophet like Moses. Who delivers his people in an even greater way from bondage to sin. You need to listen to him. You need to obey him. Or the wrath of God, John 3.36, abides on you. How could we respond in any other way? You can't be at peace with God and not be submissive to the Son. If you won't submit to the Son, God's anger rests upon you like a big cloud. So, So listen to him. If you are persuaded this is the prophet like Moses, if you're persuaded from John's gospel that God has kept his word, that the only rational, the only sane thing to do is listen to him.